This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. First, I wanted to let you know that uh, X Science has nothing to do with X Files, although our presenters tonight certainly have some surprises in store. So I'm going to introduce them individually. They can just tell a little bit about themselves. So we'll begin with Caroline Aho Franklin. Uh, hi, um, I'm a staff scientist at the Molecular Foundry at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Next, Mr. Andrew Miner. Hi, I'm a um, professor of material science and engineering at UC Berkeley and a scientist at the National Center for Electron Microscopy at LBL. And Thomas Turek. Good evening. Uh, I'm a microbiologist at the Berkeley Lab. And Spencer Klein. Hi. I'm a senior scientist in the Nuclear Science Division at Berkeley Lab. Well, one of the surprises tonight I'm going to reveal now, it's kind of obvious we have this sign that says South Pole. So sometime tonight, we hope that this phone will ring and that it's not a solicitation, that it's actually colleagues of Spencer's from the South Pole, and we're going to have a conversation. We'll see how that works. Um, when we chose the topic extreme science, we did so because we wanted you to understand that our scientists don't kind of sit in the lab and magically hope that discoveries will appear. They actually go to extreme lengths and travel extreme distances and sometimes do their work in extreme environments the results are, well, kind of extremely interesting, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Okay, we're going to begin the presentation again. The phone is scheduled to go off at, we think, at 8 o'clock, but it might come earlier, so if it does, we're just going to stop and answer it. Uh, but I will begin with uh, Mr. Miner. Please welcome him. Thank you. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. and. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is materials in extreme environments. Uh, and these environments can be, for instance, high temperatures, uh, like uh, the nickel superalloys that are inside a jet turbine engine. They have to operate at 1,500 degrees Celsius or higher. It can be environments like uh, inside nuclear reactors, where the materials are containing the reactions uh, are continually bombarded by neutrons and protons. It can be uh, extreme uh, strains, like when you're forming materials to form uh, cars, for instance. And, and, one, and two things I wanted to point out on this slide are that, number one, uh, up top, you know, performance limits uh, are really a result from instrumentable physical principles. In fact, most of the engineering materials that we have actually only operate about 5 or 10% of the theoretical strength. So there's a lot of room to grow. There's a lot of room to make better materials that can handle these extreme environments uh, uh, better. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, one thing that would be really nice is in these extreme environments to, for instance, be able to test the samples that have been in these environments or while they're in the environments, right? You'd love to take a, a little sample from inside this uh, nuclear reactor and be able to test and make sure that it's still okay and uh, that it'll last as long as you want it to last. But it's, it's a little bit harder than you might, might expect. So uh, the other thing I wanted to point out before I, I, I show you some of the results is that uh, a lot of you might not know is that materials uh, that are useful are typically crystalline. That means that the atoms inside the material are all lined up in rows, like something like the pictures at the bottom here. Uh, in, in addition, uh, in fact, one of the interesting things is that the only material we actually call crystal turns out to not be a crystal. It's actually amorphous. Um, but most of them are crystalline, and more than that, most of them have lots of defects inside them. That means that, for instance, in the bottom left here, you can see there's a missing row of atoms. And this is what's really important about crystalline materials. For instance, these missing rows are called dislocations. And the fact that these dislocations can move easily around inside a material, that's what makes metals ductile. So understanding these defects is really important to understanding the performance and the properties of materials. 
And uh, there's a great quote, of course, here from uh, Sir Frank that says, crystals are like people. It's the defects in them that make them interesting. And, and, that's, and that's really true. Um, so here's the question. So how do you see dislocations? Because they're, they're very small. They're, they're single rows of atoms. Well, of course, you need a good microscope, right? And so if you look at the difference between a, a, a caveman microscope, as drawn here by, by Gary Larson, in a light microscope, there's many orders of magnitude difference in the ultimate resolution, what you can see. Well, the difference between a light microscope and an electron microscope is also many orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude. And by using electrons instead of light, in much the same way, except for one small difference, and that's that you actually shoot electrons through the material so you can see inside it, uh, you can actually see down to the atomic level. And the lab that I work at at LBL is actually called the National Center for Electron Microscopy. We're lucky to have some of the world's best microscopes. In fact, these are two of these microscopes shown down here that each have half an angstrom resolution, which is about half the width of one atom. And these are you know, both, let's say, tied for the best microscopes in the world. And for instance, it takes pictures like this. You can see this is a gold nanoparticle. And all these little white dots, those are atoms. And you can see where the atoms are, are crystalline in the middle, and they're all lined up nicely together. And around the side, they're not. They're kind of squiggly. And that's the surfactant, the organic molecules on the outside. So these are the kind of pictures you can take. And you can look inside and see defects and see material structure. OK, that's great. So we can see material structure. We can see these dislocations. But how do you make test samples from these extreme environments? Well, it turns out there's this great machine called a focus ion beam. It's really amazing. You can actually uh, mill samples down to the nanoscale, machine them just like you would with a, a big lath, uh, lathe. But, but instead of using uh, uh, you know, drills and things like that, you use individual atoms. It's kind of like a sandblaster, but you focus the atoms down to a small point and you mill out different structures. OK, so you can, you can take materials and you can mill out little test samples and you can put them in a microscope and see inside them. That all sounds great. but and, it, and you can do tests like this. You can take little pillars like this. This is a pillar of nickel. And here it's been compressed. And you can measure the strength at which this material deforms. That's great. Except there's, there's a rub. And the rub is that the strength of materials actually depends on the size. That's not, that's not totally intuitive, right? If you look at Wikipedia and you look at what's the strength of nickel, you're going to get a number. And it's you know 200 uh, MPa or something like that. Well, Turns out that's true for almost any material you can handle with your hands. But actually, as you get smaller and smaller, microscopic and down to the nanoscale, the properties themselves change. And that's because of having a lot more surface area and actually the spacing of these defects and things like that. So the problem is shown here in this graph is that this is about the, the this, dotted, this dashed line is the macroscopic strength. That's what you measure if you had a bar of nickel and you just bent it. But as you go smaller and smaller, the strength increases. So you can't just sort of do one of these nanoscale tests and say, OK, now I know this material is still good. You have to understand how strength changes at these nanoscale levels. So this is the type of tests we do at NSM in, in, in my research group. Uh, we do small compression and tension and bending tests. And for instance, here's an example here on the, on the left. This is what it looks like in the electron microscope, this big circle here. You can see there's some pillars. Here's one that has not been deformed. Here's one that's sheared off to one side. Here's one that's sheared off to the other side. And there's this big flat punch and denter right here. And I'll show you a movie of what this looks like uh, right here. So as we're compressing, you can see a bunch of these little lines move around. The scale, for instance, you see this red line up here? That's about the width of a red blood cell. And so we're doing tests at that small scale. And the diameter of these pillars, as you can see, they're about 200 nanometers. Okay, So that's about 10,000 atoms across. And here's another one here. See, this one works a little better. You see these lines that go back and forth at the bottom here? Well, these are actually dislocations. So every one of those lines is a row of atoms that moved on another row of atoms and let this material deform. So now we're actually seeing inside a material how the defect structure evolves. So we're measuring small scale samples. And actually, at the small scale, we not only measure the properties, we actually can also see new mechanisms of deformation that might lead to better alloys and better designs. So for instance, this was a, a project I, I worked on with General Motors. And they're very interested in making cards out of magnesium, because magnesium is very light. 
Uh, so you'd love to make a card of magnesium. It would, it would have great fuel efficiency. So here we take little dog bone samples. These are, instead of a pillar that we compress, you can actually take, for instance, a little sample and pull it. That's called a tension test, right? So here's a little dog bone, and we have a little gripper. We can come in and we can pull it. And you can see in the bottom left here, this is the sample breaking. And in the middle bottom right here, you can see there's a, a bunch of these triangular-like streaks. And these are the defects that were generated during this test. And it turns out these defects are something different than a dislocation. They're called a twin. And a twin is like, if you look at this animation at the top right, the material is deformed by flipping over one another along a twin plane. And this is actually an atomic resolution image at the bottom right here of these small nanoscale twins inside the sample. And these twins actually are so small that they give you both great strength and ductility. So if we could, for instance, figure out how to make a material that generated these twins in the bulk scale, then we'd actually have a much stronger material that we could, we could, def we could form into, into the type of parts we needed to form them into. Now, as far as extreme environments, testing materials in these extreme environments, small scale testing has a big advantage there too. So for instance, this is a material that had been irradiated with protons. This is simulating what would happen inside a nuclear reactor. Because for instance, you know that it would be terrific to be able to take a little slice off the inside of a reactor and be able to tell that, that the, this material has not turned brittle over time like they usually do from the, from the bombardment of neutrons, but instead this material is still ductile and it's still damage tolerant and all these things. So you would love to be able to do a small scale test of an of a, of a irradiated sample. And what we found here was very interesting because, like I said before, you always have this general trend, smaller is stronger, and, and because of that, you really can't get a real value out of these tests. Well, it turns out in these irradiated samples, you can. And the reason is because there's so many defects in these materials, and these defects, this, this is a little, uh, this picture here in this yellow box is a, you can kind of see a triangle-like shape in this, the, in this atomic resolution image. These are called stacking fault tetrahedra, and this is the type of defects that get put into a material inside a reactor. Well, it turns out there's so many of these defects that the strength of this material is actually dependent on the spacing between the defects and not the actual spacing of the sample. And that's what this graph shows here, is that you can see here's this general smaller, stronger trend, but for the irradiated samples, the red dots, about 400 nanometers, you start to get a plateau. Oh, this, this is one. You start to get a plateau. And what that tells you is you're starting to get this macroscopic shear strength. And so really what you're testing is the real properties of this material, even though it's so small. And so these types of developments that we work on, uh, whether it's, it's, it's testing or new materials, it's all about trying to understand the defects, how they evolve, and how the material's properties change with time uh, so we could design better materials for applications like this. So with that, I'll let uh, Caroline take over. Okay. Okay. All right. So good evening, and thank you all for coming. Um, so what I'd like to tell you a little bit about today are, is really uh, my own personal fascination with living systems that survive in extreme environments, and also how we're trying to harness the unique capabilities of these living systems to actually benefit society. So one of the things that's really amazing about life is that throughout Earth's history, you can find life, particularly microorganisms, that thrive in extreme environments way too harsh for us delicate humans. So, for example, in the earliest days of Earth's history, there was um, life evolved, life began as microorganisms in an environment that was pretty much completely free of oxygen. And even today, you can go to deep sea thermal vents or to sulfur vents on the side of volcanoes, and what you'll find is teeming communities of microorganisms in environments that really first are too hot for us and also are the wrong atmosphere. So we would basically suffocate and cook in these types of environments. Um, but life survives. So how do these organisms actually, how can they survive in environments that are free from oxygen? 
Um, well, it really comes down to taking a deeper understanding of why we need to breathe oxygen. So <clears throat> in the cells of our bodies, um, what we do is our, our cells are designed to basically take food, for example, sugar, and break it down and actually move electrons from that food to oxygen. And that chemical reaction, that passing of electrons, is what gives us energy to move, to talk, to walk, to, to, to gesticulate or stumble over our words, whichever. Um, <clears throat> That's very, so for these organisms that have, involve, have evolved in oxygen-free environments, they've learned to breathe something completely different. So what they have learned to do is actually to breathe metals um, and that, so that they can actually take the electrons from their food and pass it to the metals. And that's how they get energy to go ahead and divide and grow. So. <clears throat> And you can actually, using simple microscopes, not the fancy ones that Andy has, um, you can actually watch this happen. So let me go ahead and show a little movie. So the, what, what I'm going to show you is a movie in which there are hundreds of microbes that actually surround this rock, this piece of metal containing mineral. And you'll see that it slowly starts to dissolve as the microbes actually move electrons to this material. Because that, basically, that reduction of the metals causes it to dissolve. Okay. So this, what you see is the, here's the rock, and it slowly starts to dissolve. And just to prove to you that this is indeed microbes doing the business and not just me doing some fancy chemistry, I'll show you um, a zoom in of this same reaction. So here you see the microbes all swarming towards the mineral because they're, they're basically, they need this mineral to be able to breathe and to grow and divide. So that's really exciting to me because basically these microbes are able to move electrons to metals, to wires. And so that also means that they can, and they do this from sugar. So they actually have the capability to create electricity from sugar. And here's um, a little device that I'll show you in which these microbes are actually powering a little fan. So this is a microbial fuel cell that, that uses the microbes to, f to, uh, to catalyze um, movement of electrons from sugar into electricity and actually fuel a little fan. So what this gets me really excited because I've just shown you that electrodes, or I'm sorry, that these particularly metal reducing bacteria are able to create electricity. So that gets me as a scientist really excited because I'm all too familiar with these sorts of adapters. We all have like a bag full of them where they're AC to DC adapters or different voltages or for different countries. Well, what it got me thinking about is could we actually take the ability from these native um, extreme microorganisms to create a bio to electro uh, converter where we could essentially move electrons or electricity into and out of any organism that we want? So how could we actually take that sort of very specialized trait from these extreme organisms and put them into any organism? Well, the reality is that scientists have gotten really good at this over the last 30 years. And perhaps one of the most famous examples is, is here, shown on this slide. So DNA essentially carries information, sequences of DNA carry information. And we all organisms share the same language of DNA. So what scientists have found is that, for example, if you can take the right segment of DNA from this jellyfish that can glow green in, um, and put it into a normal fruit fly, this fruit fly, you can basically confer upon it the ability to now grow, glow green. Now, that's not particularly exciting, for example, the, for the fruit fly, but it actually has been used uh, extensively to help us learn about the um, molecular processes within this, within this fruit fly. 
But basically, this is a trick that we can use for, for many different types of traits. So we wanted to see if we could use it um, in, uh, to, to be able to create this converter. So what we did is we went to this native organism. We found the DNA that we thought was responsible for the ability to move electrons to metals, and then put it into E. coli. E. coli is, is a, a, just a laboratory organism. It's a little bacteria that you can find tons of in your guts. But um, scientists have been using it extensively as a, as a way of studying bacteria. And native E. coli can't reduce metals at all. So when we, we took this DNA and put it into E. coli and wanted to ask the question, could we make electric E. coli? Um, or E. coli. <laughs> uh, and so what we, first, what we found when we did this was that the bacteria, the, our new E. coli, liked to actually bind to metals. And then it got even more interesting because what we did is we took E. coli, our, the normal strain, gave it sugar, and then removed all the oxygen, but added in some metal. And normal E. coli says, this isn't helping me at all. I have nothing to breathe. I'm just going to die. Um, whereas our electric E. coli basically can survive for a little, because now it can breathe the metal that we've supplied to it before it also tanks out and dies. So that's really exciting, because that basically tells us that we're able to create, give an, an organism the ability to breathe metals instead of oxygen. What's even more exciting is that we can now actually get electricity from this bacteria. So what we did is feed, fed this electric E. coli uh, sugar, and we can actually measure a current that it produces for a while, and then it slowly decays. But then as soon as you pop in some new sugar, some no, more food, up comes the current again. So this is, um, this is really exciting to me, because this is actually evidence that we have this bio to electrical uh, sort of converter. And it got my imagination really going about what can we do with this. And there are two things that I think um, keep me up at night dreaming about. The first is the idea to, of actually trying to create um, more efficient ways of creating bioenergy. So right now, there are many efforts to take biomass, convert it into sugars, and then have microorganisms convert those sugars into fuels. But one of the big problems is this requires a lot of land and a lot of water. So we thought about, well, what if instead you could take CO2, so a carbon, and then a source of electricity, feed it to these microbes, and get them to make biofuels? That would be really advantageous because essentially it would require a lot less land. And in theory, it could use any source of electricity to store, in the, uh, to store that energy in the form of fuels. The other area that we got really excited about is the idea of being able to actually um, repair site. So currently, there are actually people who have lost their site who now have these little microchips um, implanted in the back of their retina. And what this microchip allows you to do is to send signals from a, a camera to someone's eye, and that your eye can then read those signals and actually give you some, a sense of sight. So people who have lost their sight now, through this technology, can regain it for a while. Because after, after about a year and a half, essentially this microchip shorts out. So one of the things we're really interested in doing is asking the question, can our genes essentially remove, make this interface a lot more biocompatible, and thus hopefully more permanently allow people to regain sight? So I just want to leave you with, with the idea that we can take these extreme capabilities from these organisms, create uh, isolate DNA that has very unique capabilities, confers unique capabilities to microbes or to other organisms, and hopefully we, we hope that those can actually impact society very positively by helping with energy independence and, of course, hel helping with human health. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. 
we're going to be talking more a little bit more about microorganisms. Carl Woese, one of the most influential scientists of our time, in 2002 wrote that where there is life, there are microorganisms. I think this is a very basic statement, but, but my actual uh, inspiration is a little bit older than that because we just celebrated recently his 256th or so birthday. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, there's a reason I'm a microbiologist, not a mathematician. Uh, anyway, uh, so we just celebrated his birthday, Charles Darwin, who in 1845, some 170 years ago, almost 170 years ago, uh, basically stated that we'll see, we will find in any possible habitat on our planet some organic material, some life. And he wrote that when people couldn't fly yet to collect uh, atmospheric sample and see whether there are microorganisms in there, there was no alvin which would go down to the bottom of the deep sea. Um, there were no helicopters. I will show you pictures which I took myself from volcanoes. And he already believed in it that life can inhabit, colonize everything. And as we heard already, that most likely will be microorganisms. So what is more magnificent than Mother Nature at its best? And if you have a chance to study that, that's probably the best you can, you can get, uh, uh, the best as it can get. So my, my journey basically uh, uh, started a long time ago. But in, a, <laughs> but in the past about 20 years, I mostly dedicated my science to bioprospecting Basically a process where you go out into Mother Nature because Mother Nature has it all. You just have to look for it and microbiologists usually find whatever they are looking for. So you just have to look properly. And we'll find old or novel organisms, most likely with some novel genetic traits which uh, can be very important because it will advance science, benefit humankind, and at the same time also longer term may uh, preserve the gene pool which is out there. So my story is actually the beauty and the beast. The beauty being microbial evolution or biological evolution. And the beast, because about 15, 16 years ago, I became uh, involved or became part of a program which uh, Congress mandated uh, and the US Department of Energy is uh, performing, basically engaging former Soviet weapons scientists in peaceful projects, peaceful research, retraining them kind of and introducing them into the, nation, uh, the International uh, Society of Scientists. And what is more peaceful than, than uh, in a huge country like the former Soviet Union, go and buy a prospect uh, in areas which were totally untapped in the past. Um, so I was looking for extreme environments to find extremophilic microorganisms, microorganisms which, which basically cannot survive most of the time under normal, what we call normal conditions because they, they are used to, they evolve to be able to uh, inhabit environments which are either too, too hot or too cold or, or has unique chemistry or very little nutrients or uh, very radio, uh, radioactivity contaminated. So something is unique about the environment. But you see here, this is an image I took in uh, Kamchatka, we'll talk about it later. And uh, at that environment, water boils at 94 degrees C. Don't ask me what it is in F because I have no idea. But, but it's 94 degrees C. And I doubt it you can read it, but the thermometer shows 97 degrees C, which means that in that environment, there's a superheated water environment and microorganisms make a living in there. Actually, microbes pulled out from this hole uh, we're in the meantime introduced and, and uh, they are producing a unique enzyme which allows the paper pulp industry to reduce the amount of bleach which they use to whiten the material by about 30-40%, which is a big deal, uh, whether you take the money or, or, or the, the environmental impact of using bleach. So once we collect all this material in, in the environment, it comes to our laboratory and then in the lab, uh, we'll use a nice combination of, of uh, culture-based and kind of culture-independent, more uh, novel techniques. And I'll be happy to talk about it if you have any questions about that. 
part. So my first uh, really interesting project took me to Lake Baikal. I don't know how many of you know Lake Baikal, but Lake Baikal sits in the middle of Central Asia, uh, 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 middle of Siberia, basically. And uh, this is the largest lake in the world. I know the Canadians don't like this idea, but it's still fact, uh, as a matter of fact, it is. And it holds 25% of all terrestrial freshwater in just one lake. The average lake depth is a mile. And I learned when I was there uh, that uh, there is an international biocar drilling project going on. And luckily for me, there was no microbiologist participating in the program. So I stayed for two seasons with the uh, program and, and collected core samples aseptically for microbiology research every two meters as they came out of the ground. So that was pretty fantastic and looked then for microorganisms and cap novel capabilities which might have been hidden from uh, what we call ancient microorganisms. Uh, might have been hidden from, from, from the view because uh, our samples, our microbiological samples were the first uh, non-coastal samples ever collected in Lake Baikal. So I was uh, lucky enough uh, to be there in, in the summertime and, and move around with the boat and, and collect water samples at different depths. But also in the wintertime when outside is negative 38, it's totally frozen, that, that's what you need because the drilling barge has to be positioned in place. And then the drilling is going on and 24-7, and the cores are coming out of the ground and you take samples. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, geologist and paleoclimatologists will say that these uh, sediment samples represent 20, 10, 12 million years of records. But as a microbiologist, I would say probably the organisms in that sample are not that old because in the pore water, there might be some exchange with the water column above. But nonetheless, the results ultimately showed, and we collected about 2,500 uh, different uh, organisms out of the samples that these organs have been in isolation for a longer time. We found uh, features which were not uh, uh, traits, capabilities, genetic capabilities, which were not uh, reported earlier for other terrestrial organisms. I don't know how many of you, in the front row I see mostly uh, young people, so you won't remember, but in 1986 in April, it's gonna be 26 years soon, in Ukraine, uh, a nuclear power plant, one block of a nuclear power plant exploded and released uh, probably the largest uh, radioactive contamination known to humankind in, in that uh, context. Uh, the picture is not very good, but on the left panel, uh, but you might be able to see the destroyed block four building uh, totally exploded, totally destroyed. On the right panel, what you see is two weeks later, uh, the, uh, the plume of the uh, 131 iodine um, as it spreads out uh, in, in, in a, over the northern hemisphere. So it's, it was pretty uh, a horrible experiment, a horrible uh, uh, event. For an experimental scientist, this is an opportunity and a very unfortunate, very tragic uh, accident, but it's an opportunity not even once, hopefully not even once of a lifetime. So what we did in the Following 18, 20 years, uh, I worked with uh, colleagues who collected uh, uh, plant and, and uh, soil material and microbiological material from directly from the exploded block, from the surrounding, and then later on there was a so-called 30 kilometer radius uh, exclusion zone where there has been no human activity ever since 1986. And out of that, <coughs> a lot of plant material was uh, 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 collected and then, then generated. And right now we are screening uh, these, uh, these plant materials for, for unique antivirals. It's a unique application, but, but uh, we know that plants, uh, especially if you tweak the plants a little bit, in culture they might produce some interesting natural products and we are screening these natural products if there are any antivirals among them. Um, Closer to my field, uh, about over 2,000 fungal organisms were uh, collected out of the Chernobyl exclusion zone and, and the exploded block over a period of 18 years. 
And there are several very interesting aspects to it, but let me just give you two. One is that it gave me the opportunity to collect fungal material in varying distance from the radioactive source and find sometimes uh, strains of the very same species very differently adapting to the radiation, uh, uh, to the uh, contamination uh, in the environment with time and with distance. And you see the features, what made all those fungi capable of surviving in the most uh, uh, radioactive environment, which capabilities then missing or is being diluted out as the organism is further uh, uh, found from the radiation source. Another interesting aspect was that, which was news to us, that uh, we know microbiologists, we know that microorganisms constantly monitor their environment and, and, and interact with it, but it was news to us that fungal organisms, which were totally differently described so far, can sense radioactivity and then in, in basically grow into the direction of the radioactive source. And you can play that in the laboratory also with, with uh, small radioactive particles. And actually, when they reach the radioactive uh, source, they grow much better and faster. So far, my, uh, fungal organisms were considered uh, organisms which need organic material to grow on. That's what their carbon energy source is. And if that can be proven uh, uh, that this is, and, and uh, the whole me mechanism for that can be found, how they sense the radioactivity and, and, and actually take advantage of it as an energy source, that would mean that pretty much all the textbooks have to be rewritten, which is not, this is how science evolves. So we call this uh, unique feature positive radiotropism. Um, the past seven years, uh, I've, I'm really humbled to say that, but I had the uh, uh, opportunity and, and the honor to uh, take uh, expeditions to the Kamchatka Peninsula. Kamchatka Peninsula is in the Russian Far East at the uh, Pacific Ocean. This is how far you can go in a country with 11 timelines. Time lines. And that uh, 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 peninsula basically uh, provides pristine environments because there's hot, it's the size of California, a little bigger than California, 250,000 people live there and there are about uh, 50 miles of, of, of paved roads. The rest of the traffic has to be done by helicopters. So uh, in this pristine environment, you can find permafrost areas and volcanoes. Basically, this is where the, uh, the uh, circle of fire uh, uh, ends. And hundreds and thousands of, of uh, geysers and fumaroles and mud pools and very interesting geothermal and, and hydrothermal environment. Actually, because one of the major uh, collection sites where we worked for many seasons uh, is about two hours by helicopter, so we managed to build out of your taxpayer, thank you very much, out of your taxpayer money, a little field station where we can work and stay. Uh, I don't know if the pointer works, but there's a little dot here on the Google map. That's where our house is, this here. So you can find it on the Google map. Um, <clears throat> and that allows us to spend the time from end of May until middle of September, uh, where the, this is the period where the helicopter really safely can fly. And uh, we collected all kinds of uh, material, always rationally desi uh, designing what we want to collect this year. And here I'm showing you some, some results. Uh, uh, one focus area was trying to find natural products which these fungal organisms or any microorganism is producing that can be used in crop protection. And we were very successful of pulling out of, oh, I'm sorry, pulling out of this mud pool here. It's not wanting to show, so this here on the left plan. A bunch of microorganisms which produce antifungal molecules, which we tested, and the tests are shown on the right panel, and then reverse engineered the whole story and found in the microorganisms the genetic coding for all these 
peptides or polypeptides. And then, you might not like it, but that's the future, I'm sorry. Put that into plants, crop plants, which now are producing their own antifungal uh, molecules. So the uh, plant pathogenic fungi cannot damage and attack the plant. Now, the options currently would be synthetic chemicals, which are not natural, sprayed all over the plants, or the plant growing, <coughs> excuse me, with its own antifungal molecules. I think uh, that's a much better solution because it's more natural. Um, how that works, a couple of pictures that plant cells are kind of hardy to work with. So what you need into, uh, f to introduce microbial uh, genetic material, new genetic material into the plant cell, you use a so-called gene gun, which uses high pressure to blast in into the plant cells uh, the new genetic material. And on the right-hand panels, you see some examples how that then looks like. Another area of interest was uh, finding insecticidal molecules. Again, Mother Nature has it all. My, microorganisms and insects have been uh, interacting with each other for billions of years or millions of years. Um, so what we were looking for, uh, there are certain bacteria which uh, produce some crystalline protein material which acts as a natural insecticidal molecule. So I don't know if you can see it, but in there, there are big blocks, nice uh, blocks of protein, protein material, which when the uh, insect is chomping on, on the plant material or tries to, and the plant material has this, this, uh, these bacteria on its surface, then those crystals will ultimately poke holes into the guts of the insect and the insect will die. Uh, now again, uh, the story goes that we can produce in the laboratory these clusters of crystals, that's, that's not a big deal. But the big deal is to try to find the genetic information for the production of these uh, toxin mo toxic molecules and put that into the crop plant and let the transgenic plant do their own uh, protection. Lately, uh, we expanded bioprospecting into new areas uh, with new foci. Uh, we are looking for uh, organisms which, which can survive in very salty environments with, with very little water. Water will be a major issue in our future and especially in the younger generation future. So we will need plants which can do it uh, without or make it without much with much less water than what we need to have today. So microorganisms again can help. The gene pool is there. We just have to find the proper ones. We are working in Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan it has a lot of uh, uh, all contaminated environments uh, and we are uh, isolating organs which can degrade all contaminants because all contamination happens as we know sometimes here in the Gulf of Mexico and so. Uh, and the latest focus was uh, finding uh, really efficient organisms which can degrade lignocellulosic material. Uh, you just heard about the, the option of biofuel, making biofuels. And there are many organisms which can do that, but none of them are so successful like these kind of fungi. And I have here four different kinds for you to uh, uh, enjoy the image, which grow on, on either live or dead woody material. These are the most successful. And, and we have a whole screening program for, for uh, finding these organisms. Uh, in different versions of trying to produce these enzymes. And once we have the uh, genetic information which is responsible for the enzyme production, that can biodegrade, break down the lignocellulosic material. We kind of speed up the evolutionary process in the laboratory and, and um, play a little bit with the DNA molecules. We already heard the term DNA molecules. So play a little bit with the DNA molecules and actually make much better enzymes than Mother Nature at this time of the evolution, this point of the evolution uh, really managed. Uh, we have been successful. Uh, we have reported uh, much better uh, enzyme productions for this unique uh, complex called lignocellulose uh, than anybody else so far published in the world. So we have a lot of 
patents. This is how you measure success when you work with the industry. Now and then, you, you're lucky and you can publish something, but most of the time, you measure success by, by patent protection for your intellectual property. So to sum it up, what I have to say, it humbles me simply to be able to go to all these extreme environments where, as we heard, no other creature could survive but microorganisms. What you see here is a crater lake with a pH of 0.75. Uh, that's pre acidic. Um, and microorganisms make a living in there. We are, uh, collected microorganisms from that crater lake in, in Kamchatka. So these uh, 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 bioprospecting expeditions allowed my laboratory and myself uh, to uh, improve tremendously uh, our culturing techniques, our molecular level techniques, and especially scale up protocols because whatever it happens really successfully in the laboratory, it's not a given that it's gonna happen in larger industrial scale. Actually, it's still more an art than a science. But uh, what we have done, it's also incredible, of incredible value to the industry because uh, with my partners, with our partners, uh, it provided them the cutting edge to pr generate transgenic plants. And these plants spent several years in, in a greenhouse and now are uh, uh, growing in a field, in an open field. Uh, we have a couple of other ideas in a drawer. This is how you try to build a future on post-harvest modification, edible vaccines, not with a needle, but you eat it. And of course, lignocellulose uh, biodegradation. And again, as I said at the beginning, I'm very proud that I took this picture of the, of course, from the helicopter, but uh, from a, a volcano, because in, in Kamchatka, there are always about 20, 30 volcanoes active. Thank you very much for your interest. So now for a little bit of a change of pace, I'm going to tell you about some extreme astrophysics. Um, the physics I do is to try and look for some of the most extreme environments in the cosmos. And this shows you an example of one. This is a galaxy, this galaxy. The center, it's got a supermassive black hole, which is rotating, which gives it a bit of a magnetic field. And you can see that there's a jet of particles coming out per perpendicular to the axis. That jet is the moving at relativistic velocities close to the speed of light. And we believe that it's possible this may be the accelerators that produce the ultra high energy cosmic rays that we observe on Earth. Um, to study these jets, we use a rather special tool called a neutrino. Neutrinos are interesting because they go through almost anything. Most of the things you know, light or alpha particles, are stopped by a piece of paper. Other types of radiation, beta rays, are stopped by a few centimeters of aluminum. And you can even stop gamma rays or X rays with a few inches of lead. However, neutrinos will go through almost anything. And by that, I mean you can have neutrinos produced even in the center of the star, star for example, our own sun. And those neutrinos will make it out of the sun or out of that star. They can travel. They can enter the Earth, can they, go, they can go through the Earth, and occasionally one of them will interact in Antarctica and produce a shower of particles coming upward through the, out of the Earth. And that's what we try and study. Um, we do that with two detectors that I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that because neutrinos go through almost anything, that means they don't interact very much. So that means you need truly enormous detectors to be able to see them. So we use two detectors. The first one is called Ice Cube. It's located at the South Pole, well, actually about a kilometer away, but at Amundsen Scott Station. Um, and that's a detector that is up and running, and I'll talk about that a bit. And then we're also working on an experiment called Ariana, which is on the Ross Ice Shelf, about 100 kilometers south of McMurdo Station. And you can see here in black, McMurdo Station, this is the main U.S. logistics base in Antarctica. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, Ariana, in contrast to Ice Cube, is um, just under getting started. We deployed a prototype station there a few years ago. So um, 
The other thing to keep in mind about working in Antarctica is it's a very difficult environment. And things that are very, <clears throat> would be very simple in a lab at Cal or at LBL can be very difficult. You know, even things like providing power, that's an enormous struggle. <clears throat> and of course, things have to be extremely reliable. And the big thing is you need everything you need and you need it there. You can't just run out to a hardware store. Um, you know, so um, an awful lot of what I'll talk about, there's an enormous effort in logistics, considerably more so than actually doing the science. And I'll show you some examples of that. So to get to Antarctica, you start out in Christchurch, New Zealand. And of course, there's no, fl no regular flights to Antarctica. So the Air Force provides planes. This is a C-17 landing literally on the Ross ice shelf. <clears throat> you get off, and well, this shows the inside of the plane. You can see passengers on the side, cargo in the middle. That's so the passengers are there to protect the cargo if anything shifts during flight. So then get to, and Ed McMurdo, they have um, a lot of specialized heavy vehicles to um, be able to move people around and things around. Um, if you're going on to the South Pole, you will um, then shift gears and shift planes and take fly on one of these smaller LC-130s, um, actually operated by the New York Air National Guard, despite what it says on the side. The notable thing here is you can see this plane is landing on skis rather than on wheels. <clears throat> and that's because of the snow conditions. So, and once you get there, then you can start working. This shows an aerial view of the South Pole. You can see up in blue is the new, I don't know, is this? Okay, well, maybe you can see, this shows the new station. The actual South Pole is here. This is the skiway. Um, and then the experiment uh, ice cube is kind of located all around here. There's not much to see on the surface. This counting house contains our surface electronics. And this drill camp is something we use for constructing the experiment. But most of the action is under the surface into this um, bottom kilometer of ice. What we do is we dr drilled 86 holes down, each 2,400 meters. It's about a mile and a half. And then we lower a cable, like that shown here, into the hole with these optical modules. There's one there. And this is a prototype optical module. <clears throat> you can get an idea of what it looks like. Um, it's made of half inch thick glass on the outside. And the business end is a photo tube, which is sensitive to light. And so what happens is occasionally a neutrino will come in and interact in the ice. It will produce a bunch of electrically charged particles. This could be electrons, positrons, or other particles. These particles will move through the ice um, near, at near the speed of light. And as they do that, they will emit light, known as Cherenkov radiation. And by looking at the arrival times and amount of light in the different optical detectors, we can get a pretty good idea of the neutrino direction often to within a degree, and some idea of the energy. So this shows the main activity in Ice Cube, which is a, actually a very mundane construction activity, drilling the holes. I showed you this drill camp here is essentially a five megawatt hot water heater. It uses technology that's borrowed from car washes, and we use that to produce 5,000 gallons a minute of water that's heated to 88 degrees centigrade. And then that water comes and goes through here, through this drill tower, and we just melt our way down through the ice. It takes about 40 hours to get down to 2,400 meters, and then about another 12 hour to deploy the, the cable and the optical modules. Um, and again, getting back to logistics, I just like this picture. This shows the old South Pole Station was built in 1975. It was on the surface then. Now, this, I took this picture in 2006. It's almost buried, and in fact, it has since been dis disassembled. Um, this shows you the inside under that dome. There's buildings, and typically about 30 people would spend the winter there. Now, we have the new station, and um, modern technology permitting, we will hear from two, two of our winter overs. These are people who spend the winter there specifically to maintain the ice cube equipment on the surface and keep everything operating. So 
Um, Ariana, in contrast, is a greenfield site, or maybe I should say a white, white field site. So it's, there's, until we went there, there had been nobody at this area, at least as far as we know. Um, so to get there, you go out in a helicopter, this shows leaving, in McMur leaving McMurdo Station, and then this shows, um, it, actually this was a later helicopter arrival at the site. You can see there's absolutely nothing there. Um, you know, when we were flying out there, the helicopter pilot asked where we wanted to land, and we said, you know, anywhere around here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it dropped us off and then came back the next day. You can see this is our scientific equipment and these are some of the large tents. Um, and again, this is the point, you know, we had to spend more time, way more time gathering equipment than we actually spent out at the site. And we were out at the site for 11 days. So our main purpose was to install a prototype detector. This works on a, works on a principle that's very similar to Ice Cube. It looks for this Cherenkov radiation from neutrino interactions, except it's looking for more energetic neutrinos, and that turns out to be better done with radio waves, which are also electromagnetic, just like photons, but much longer wavelength. So the business end of the detector are the prototype were four antennas like these. Um, those of you who are old enough will remember traditional television antennas. These are very, very similar to those. And then there's a box, electronics box, that looks at the antennas and looks for short pulses of electromagnetic radiation or radio waves that you would get from a neutrino interaction. Um, and again, that's something that would be quite simple doing it around here. The difficulty, of course, is all the logistics. So in addition to the antenna, we have a box that contains the data acquisition electronics. And then this tower, which contains power. You can see there's four solar cells. Um, that works well in the summer. Of course, it's useless in the winter when it's dark for about five and a half months. There's a um, wind generator here, which we were hoping would provide enough power for in the winter. It turned out not to. It's not a very windy site. And then there's um, GPS antennas, so we can know what time it is, and um, a iridium satellite modem for short-term communication, or for low bandwidth communication, I should say. Um, I just want to show you this picture shows Torsten Stetzelberger working in our laboratory. Um, so he was an engineer that went with me. This shows the entire camp, um, get an idea of the ratio of logistics to other things. This is our toilet tent. These three tents were sleeping tents. You can see the station. Behind it was our cooking and dining and some laboratory tent. And then our equipment box. And then this was the internet link. And this internet link is important because we're only there for 11 days. We eventually want the station to run year round. We want to be able to talk to it. We want to be able to get substantial amounts of data out of it. Of course, you know, around here, just plug, you know, find the nearest Wi Fi node. We didn't have that. Um, so, in fact, we had a bit of a problem because this is something called Mina Bluff. It stood between the site and McMurdo Station. It's, I think, somewhere around 1,000 feet high. And it's high enough, and it blocks radio waves. And in a way, that's good, because remember, we're burying these antennas in the ice. We don't want a lot of man-made interference. On the other hand, when you're trying to get your data out on a very different frequency, it's a problem. So what we had to do was went up to Mount Discovery. And Mina Bluff is kind of off to the right here. And roughly where that red dot is, um, we set up an internet relay station, which had line of sight to our camp and also line of sight to McMurdo Station. And that ended up working pretty well, although, of course, we had to spend some time screwing with it to get it to work. Um, so um, before I conclude, I just want to point out you know, an important thing. Um, you, know, you may see us as individual scientists here, but science is really, really a group effort. And that's especially true at the South Pole. Um, the huge number of scientists, engineers, technicians, programmers, drillers, heavy equipment operators, um, pilots, <laughs> no, no reindeer, unfortunately. <laughs> pilots, logistics, uh, cooks. This is excellent timing, so I hope, hopefully. Hello? Hello? Hi, is that Sven? Yes, hello, it's Sven and Carlos. Senator Carlos, hi. This is great timing. 
Um, we're here at the Berkeley Rep Theater, and um, there's people here who would like to know what it's like at the South Pole. Okay. Yeah, so, so right now it's uh, minus 49 feet for 64 Fahrenheit. We have a twenty knot wind, so our wind chill right now is minus 70 or minus 93 F. You guys get that? Uh, it's right um, now nine degrees above horizon, and it will set on March 21st. It said it was minus 49 degrees centigrade with wind chill minus 93 Fahrenheit. Um, so, so um, what are your days like? Um, I understand the station closed last week. How many of you are there for the winter? We're, we're 50 people here right now for the winter. So we're going to be stuck here for eight months. Mm -hmm. and, and what's your typical day like? It, it varies quite a bit. I mean, we constantly check the detector, and we do special runs when required. Uh, we help out with things on station, and like just an hour ago, we had a fire alarm we had to respond to. It's, no day is like another one. Yeah, just, actually, there's people at, hold on, do people, somebody have a question? How much time total have you spent at the South Pole? How much time have you spent at the South Pole so far? And I guess, how much longer do you have? Okay, so both me and Carlos are right here on November 3rd, and we're scheduled to leave, and that was last year, November 3rd last year, and we're scheduled to leave mid-November this year. So we'll pretty much be here in over a year. Okay. What? Um. I cannot wrap my head around minus 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. So the, the question was that somebody's having trouble understanding what minus 93 degrees Fahrenheit is like. I mean, how do you handle it? Can you even go outside? What do you wear? Yeah, so we wear multiple layer of clothes. So today, like 20 knot wind, it's actually very cold just because the wind like, gets through your clothing. But we have big parkas, but special shoes, and then we just have thermal underwear and just have layer and layer. And try to avoid being outside as much as possible. But I mean, we also have to take advantage of it's only another couple of weeks to have the sun up. Mm -hmm. We need to do all the work that we can while the sun is up. OK. Maybe we take one more question. Okay. So the question was about how you divide your time between work and social things, and what do you do for social things? And maybe you could say a bit about you know this sleeping and eating there. Okay. Uh, so we each have our own room. They're very small, pretty much like a cell in a prison. You got a bed in those. But we each have our own room. We have uh, three meals a day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And for the people working night, we have a big leftover break where we just go and eat whatever we want. Yeah. We get cooked meals six days a week. Sundays are like a day off from station. But like for me and Carl, our days kind of depends on what happens to the detector. So we don't really have days off, but we're very flexible. Like we want to do some some fun things where nothing is happening, that's fine. We don't have a regular, regulated schedule. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, we have things going on. Tonight is going to be volleyball. Uh, <laughs> we had a Mardi Gras party last Saturday. Uh, we're going to have bingo this coming weekend. Uh, Carlos is running a bit in the gym. I'm rowing, I'm skiing. So we try to keep ourselves busy. But work, work and, and recreation kind of go hand in hand. So we're kind of always involved. OK. Well, th thank you very much, Sven and Carlos. <laughs> Applause for all of our scientists. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would comment. I have not been there during the winter, but I, when I was there during the summer, and the temperatures were often between 20 and 50 below centigrade, you know, it, you couldn't go outside with any exposed flesh, but the equipment they gave you was really, really good, and it was not bad going out. Um, I mentioned the experiment was kind of a kilometer from the South Pole. It was really not too bad to walk it. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Lab Scientists. So we're going to be begin the, uh, the public Q&A. And again, there are microphones here, here, and at the top for those who are in the balcony. But before we begin, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, so Thomas, uh, a point of clarification. Um, I wasn't sure what lignocellulose depolymerization was. Uh, so what we, it was an of course. So can you explain it to, for me? Is it an uh, eloquent way to say to break down cellulose, uh, lignocellulose? Uh, plant cell wall has evolved to be a very complex, very sturdy structure. And believe it or not, people are studying plant cell walls over 100 years. And if you Google it or try to find on the internet, is there a model how these components, lignin, hemicellulose, cellulose, are, and some other polymers, are mixed together and how they, they look like actually in the cell wall? You will have hard time. So useful for biofuels, perhaps? Uh, ultimately, yes. yes what we okay. like to do is, is break it down. Remember, there's a one billion ton challenge just in the US. One billion tons of uh, agricultural waste are available every year annually for biodegradation, sugar formation, which then can be converted to biofuel. OK. But what you need is uh, good enzymes to break down the, break down, depolymerize. OK, I have it now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the group, um, so what, what is this sort of joint attraction here for extreme science? I mean, is there something called calm science that, you, that other people do? <laughs> I, <laughs> what, what, what's, what's the unifying principle? I mean, you could have chosen to do other things, but you're going to these environments and studying what you do. Any connection there? Any reason why you're doing it in particular? No? That, that's where the interesting stuff happens. Yeah. yeah. OK. I mean, whether it's in microbes or, or materials, too. Right. And that's where the. Yeah. We, we know there are these enormous accelerators somewhere in the universe. And we just don't know where they are. And we, even though after 100 years of effort, literally, because cosmic rays were discovered 100 years ago. And just it's amazing trying to find them or figure out where they are. So Caroline. I know you have something to say here. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, for me, it's just also this kind of thing where you're just impressed. You know, we think we're humans, we've got big brains, we're really advanced. But here are these microbes that can survive things that we can't even, we can't even dip our finger in, you know. So I think it, and there are many more of them than, than there are of us by mass or by number, <laughs> choose your choose Should your we name. be fearful of that? No. No. <laughs> no, but they're essential for keeping the planet running. They're essential for, car for cycling carbon, for cycling nitrogen, for cy cycling iron, and that's what keeps the planet alive. But you also see the amazing things that they can do, and that's really exciting to me as a scientist. Thomas, the same attraction for you? I'd be more modest uh, and say two things. One is, if you go out to your backyard and grab a handful of dirt, you have the same chance to find some interesting organisms in there than near a volcano. But uh, how was that with the, with the Himalaya? Why did you climb it, Mount Everest? Because it's there. So if you have a chance to go to extreme environments, it's more likely that you will find organisms which we have not seen before capabilities which we have not seen before. So it makes perfect sense. But uh, I said I'd be more modest. In my book, basically any environment is extreme in one way or another. Hmm. Because it doesn't have to be an exploded nuclear power plant in order to find unique organisms. <laughs> Look at it, uh, uh, how many unique organisms have been found just in, on the human body or in the human body simply because the tools are so much better today than 20 years ago. OK, one last question for me, and then I'll leave it to the audience. But <clears throat> what does this tell us about the 
possibility of finding different kind of life forms on other planets. There seems to be this bias towards carbon-based organisms. So does this give us any insight into what we might find at some, in some other locations? Mm. 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 <laughs> Caroline, you must have an answer. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> No, Can I yield to your wisdom? <laughs> yeah, it's, yes. it, it's only speculation, but, but uh, two things. One is, if we try to find life as we know it, there are fair chances that we will miss it. Because if you look at the periodic table, there's not much reason why life decided to become carbon-based on, on our planet while carbon is not among the 10 most abundant elements of the Earth's crust, and there's so much more silicon. And if you look at the periodic table, silicon behaves pretty similar to carbon. So if you, if you try to look for life as we know is here on the planet, there's a fair chance we'll miss it. But on the other hand, there are certain things, and astrophysicists will tell us how we can approach that, which will prove that there is biology ongoing. Uh, the smart biologists state that where there's water, there's life, and where there's life, there are microorganisms. So I will have a job. <laughs> okay. All right, with that, let's start. Do we have someone at this mic? Uh, yes, right here. Yes, hi. A question maybe for Dr. Torek uh, and maybe the others. Um, recently in a soil study class, um, I think the characterization was made that um, even in the backyard, as, as you describe, something like only 5% of the organisms are thought to have been characterized. I'm not sure what that means, but perhaps you can, also, you can talk about um, that. And, and, and you offered to talk perhaps about the detection mechanisms that, that, that we have now that we didn't have before. You said both cultured and, and, and other types of, of ways to um, characterize or find, find uh, living forms. If you could help us. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, microbiology dates back to 1670s when Anthony van Leeuwenhoek first, as a first human being, saw what he called little animals. He was the first one who opened up a new world which humankind didn't even know about it. It, it would be the same value as somebody tomorrow would find life outside the uh, uh, planet, something totally new. But in the past history of microbiology, microbiologists usually cultivated or tried to cultivate organisms. And, and it is a very difficult situation because microorganisms hardly ever live alone in the environment. They always live in communities, and the communities are very strongly organized, regulated, and interdependent on each other capabilities. Now, if you pull out organisms out of this environment, put them into the laboratory where uh, you use nutrients which these organisms in nature have probably never seen, and try to grow them as a pure culture because that's what traditional microbiology wants and, and the industry needs. You need the organism if you want to make antibiotics so that, that there's logic behind it. But ultimately, that leads to the now uh, uh, understanding that since we cannot simulate the environment and the conditions in the habitat where the organisms was isolated from, it is very difficult to grow organisms. And non-culture based techniques which uh, take the environmental sample and, and uh, characterize something in it like, like extract all the nucleic acids and, and, and try to figure out how many different organisms live in that environment have shown us that depending on what organisms we are talking about. But in case of bacteria, we probably have studied less than 1% of the organisms living in nature. In case of fungi, the number will go up to maybe 5%. But the young generation has still plenty opportunities to discover new organisms. Because for 99 plus percent of the microorganisms, we know very little what they look like, what they actually do, what is their role in the environment. But there are very good techniques and, and, and the development of, of uh, technologies which can help microbiology to move on are exponentially getting better. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, this gentleman here. My question kind of expands on what you've been talking about. Um, the, uh, the nature of farming is to change your environment, kind of make your own ecosystem to, to better yourself. And, um, and I'm really excited to see um, developments in science that help that end a little more naturally, um, but then also to what end should it stop. Um, being a recent addition to the Berkeley area, um, I was immediately surprised at how many people really cared about having natural food organically grown, locally grown, stuff like that. Um, do, you, do you know how this sort of research will end up impacting um, ecosystems as a whole or you know, kind of locally to the farm? Um, or is that something that will just be considered, I guess, later on down the line? Does Caroline, do you want to comment on that? Um, so I, I think one of the things you have to realize is that if you look at the, the Earth as a whole, it's an environment that we as humans have radically altered. Um, so even, f as you say, even farming itself is, is a radical change. But basically, we, we as scientists are aware that, and the public is aware, that genes confer new traits. And so we're very interested and very cautious about trying to f make sure that whatever new traits we give to, to for example, food-bearing um, plants, we try and build in as many safeguards as possible to prevent the spread of the, those traits to, to other natural um, organisms. So we frequently not only build in one, but several of those, so that basically those organisms need, for example, specific nutrients from, from us uh, in order to survive. So that they can't just sort of live free and go wherever they want. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Does we have someone over here, yes. Yes, and uh, this is for Spencer Klein. When you were detecting the neutrinos, how did you know they were neutrinos and not something else? Um, well, for the most of them, as I said, you know, we're looking for things that were going upward through our detector, and we don't know of any other particle that could go all the way through the Earth and then interact below the detector and come, go upward. Okay. That fits. Okay. And then for uh, Andrew Miner, question for you, when you were working with uh, magnesium metals, well, being on a, from active duty experiences as well, I realize that that catches fire. There's nothing that's going to put it out. What can you do ahead of time to mitigate the particular problem? Um, yeah, that's, that's right of, you know, really small little magnesium particles and things like that. But a big bar of magnesium, mm -hmm. uh, it has a passivating oxide on it, so it's, it's completely stable. So you know, when, when it's in a big form that you would you know, build onto a car or something, it's, it's not uh, ignitable like that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, someone here? Um, so I know that the ice cube of... detector you, is buried under hundreds of feet of ice to prevent cosmic radiation from setting it off. So how does Ariana stop that? Well, uh, that's a good question. I should say, even, you know, even though Ice Cube is down 1,500 meters, there's still a lot of cosmic ray particles going downward through it. There's about 500,000 times as many particles going downward from cosmic rays, you know, interactions above it, as there are from neutrinos going upward. Um, and we have, that's why we have all of these phototubes to look at the pattern of the light. Um, Ariana uses a different technique. It's only sensitive to very high energy neutrinos. So we'll only pick up detect cases where there's a lot of energy deposited in a very, very small volume. And that's something you would pretty much only get from a neutrino interaction, an ultra high energy neutrino interaction. Um, in addition to that, the downward going cosmic rays, you know, you would develop a shower of particles in the air as it goes down to the detector. So our plan is to probably put occasional antennas on the detectors sticking up into the air to look to see if there's anything coming down. Okay, we have uh, another one over here. Yes. 
Hi, uh, thanks for the talks. Um, I was just wondering if uh, the microbiologist had any idea uh, exactly what the fungi were sensing when they're moving towards the radiation source, uh, like the radiotropic behavior? Uh, like what they're actually detecting or if they're just moving toward heat or something like that? Let's put it that way that we are only so far that we observe this capability and colleagues in Ukraine and, and uh, here in the United States are working on these experiments uh, to repeat it in under laboratory settings. And uh, about a handful of publications are out there, which are really interesting, but we don't know what the mechanism is. What's interesting that most of these organisms are uh, pigmented, black pigmented organisms, very rich in melanin. And, and melanin is known to be a kind of a, a oxygen radical scavenger. So it could be some role there. Uh, there must be a reason why uh, most of these organisms are so uh, deeply black pigmented that can survive and show this positive radiotropism feature. Uh, about 25% of the fungi which we collected uh, have shown this capability, and most of them were collected very close to the exploded nuclear power plant, either directly on the block by robots, collected by robots, or, or nearby. We don't know the mechanism yet. Thank you. Uh, next question. What has, prevented the, what has prevented the evolution of macroorganisms that live in boiling water or subacid lakes? Is preventing. That's it. You want to get? No, go ahead. No. Okay. So, so one of the things that um, microbes have evolved to do is to be able to get energy from many different sources. And um, however, when basically the amount of energy you can get by reacting, for example, sugar with a metal moving the electrons is actually much, much smaller than what you can get from moving electrons from sugar to oxygen. And so that's one of the reasons that you find um, larger organisms usually rely on oxygen, because they can just basically get more energy from the chemical reactions that you can do with oxygen. Um, but uh, I, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Uh, you know, evolution is not standing still. <laughs> In other words, the organisms would not have enough spare energy. Every cell needs to produce energy. You don't right. have enough energy for differentiation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's just sort of macroorganisms need a lot more energy for all the little specialized functions that, that we have, whereas microbes, they're pretty simple, and so they can, they can grow and divide with a bit less energy. Well, is it also that the, most of the world is, you know, not 7 pH. I mean, so, so most of the evolution that's happened it happens in not such extreme environments. Most of the, uh, most of the. I mean, you have uh, to, so, so you got these lakes that are very acidic and these microorganisms are evolving right. there. But most of the world is not so acidic. Right, so you definitely have more evolution occurring in, in non-extreme environments, that's correct. Actually, organisms which live under extreme environment, pH, extreme environmental conditions, whether very acidic or very uh, alkaline, they evolve to have mechanisms to differentiate between outside pH, which is so extreme, and the internal pH, because the internal pH in those cells is still very close to the neutral. Otherwise, uh, the machinery wouldn't work. But they have to, uh, had to evolve capabilities, which are some of them are passive, some of them are active energy uh, requiring, uh, introduction requiring mechanisms to spiff up the, the cells and the protection of the cells so that they can withstand and, and make a living under those extreme environmental conditions. Because there's a reason why we use bleach and clean up st stuff, because that would kill microorganisms. And the same for acids. But there are organisms which live way beyond that bleach pH or the, the very acidic pH. But inside the cell, it's still close to neutral. 
Thank you. I think we have another question. Hi. Um, once more, thank you very much to LBL and to, uh, to the scientists here for this program in general and the really exciting uh, things that you've presented tonight. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Miner, um, you talked about a phenomenon um, of smaller uh, objects um, being stronger than uh, larger ones and, and that, that linear relationship that you described. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Is that entirely due to surface uh, tension, essentially, in those materials, or is there some other way that we can, you can describe or characterize why that, why that occurs? Um, yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, in these structures that I showed, one of the reasons it occurs is because uh, those defects, when they run through the material and they hit a surface, they escape, and there's no more defect. And so materials become more and more sort of perfect uh, as you deform them, and that's one of the strengthening mechanisms. Uh, but on the other hand, there's other mechanisms uh, at these small scales, uh, like the ability to create new defects from the surface. It's actually easier to create these dislocations at a surface than it is inside. And so oftentimes, there's a lot of competition between dislocations escaping and dislocations starting, and how they do so and uh, determines a lot of the properties. Also, um, it, there's a similar phenomenon in real materials, bulk materials, where you change an internal dimension that, that I didn't really talk about. The internal dimension can be something like grain size. So crystals, they're all the atoms are lined up. Uh, but inside a real material, you have different grains that all have different orientations. And as you change the grain size, you dramatically alter the properties of the material. So, so, so changing these internal dimensions and the external dimensions, these are the handles that you have to, to play around with uh, the properties when you talk about mechanical properties. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. This question is for Caroline, talking about the um, metal-eating microbes and how, I guess I, I wanted to hear more about how those would produce biofuels. I just wasn't quite sure. <coughs> Thank you. That's a good question. So basically, as uh, Thomas already told you, microbes need a couple things to grow. Um, so they basically need an energy, well, many things, but the key most crucial ones are a source of carbon and a source of uh, energy and also a source of reducing equivalents. So biofuels are basically reduced carbon. Um, they're carbons bonded to lots of hydrogens where CO2 is carbon bonded to lots of oxygen. And basically the difference in what the carbon is bonded to is the difference between something that's waste product from a biofuel, CO2, and something that's a biofuel. So what we're really hoping is that basically we can inject electricity into the bacteria as a source of reducing equivalents and CO2 and have the bacteria essentially as part of its metabolism, you know, take that electricity and create carbon-carbon bonds that would form a biofuel. And the benefit of all of that is basically we can harness, we, we can actually um, use many different sources of electricity as well as we can capture um, energy, solar energy and convert it into electricity much more efficiently than plants can capture solar energy and create biomass. So basically, we can basically get to biofuels, hopefully, hopefully, much more efficiently um, than through, uh, than go by going through biomass. Thank you, and I think you are going to be our last question for the evening. Okay, I just had a quick question for Spencer. You mentioned that neutrinos are constantly passing through things and that we observe some that interact. Mm -hmm. Do we know why they, are interacting so randomly, or is it just chance? Um, it's essentially just chance. I mean, the, you know, the higher energy neutrinos are more likely to interact, but it's just occasionally one of them will hit a proton or a neutron in a certain way and react. To Thanks. Spencer, when is your next trip to the South Pole? Um, I'm hoping to go back to the Ariana site in November, okay, great. but that remains to be confirmed. Okay, that concludes the program for this evening. Thank you, audience. Thank you, lab scientists. We'll see you again on April 23rd at Berkeley Rep, the smaller stage next door. Thank you very much for coming.